Okay, so thank you so much for turning us on again. So today I wanted to, um, you know, started with the seven factors of awakening and I already said, you know, that's the seven qualities which need to be cultivated in order, you know, to penetrate our cognitive and emotional filters so that we can really, you know, be with experience as it really is and not, you know, getting lost in our conditioning, which we usually tend to project onto our experience. And then, you know, we are kind of always experiencing the same thing. And uh, it has a lot to do with our own fixations, those filters, which need to be removed, really. And that's what the practice is all about. You know, these different skillful means, and they look vastly different in the different schools of Buddhism, the different lineages come from different countries, different cultures, different times, and so on. And they look vastly different on the surface, but in the depths, they are all geared towards the same insight. And you know, it's that insight into emptiness or not self, how it's called in early Buddhism, anatta. And uh, this essential insight, you know, and all of the different methods, they're like fingers pointing towards the moon. But if you're not looking at the moon, you know, then you're getting stuck on the finger, then that's not really very much uh, helpful, you know, for our lives, because then nothing is going to change and we might become you know, a specialist in knowing all the different fingers and, and so on, but we've never looked at the moon. And because of that, we don't know. So, you know, this teaching about not-self or anatta or emptiness, how it's uh, later been expressed, you know, that was a, a completely new teaching which the Buddha brought when he was on a walking the earth in Iron Age India about 2,600 plus years ago. And it was a teaching which hadn't already been there. The teaching on impermanence, you know, there were other teachers who were teaching that. Also in the West, the Heraclitus, for example, was a Greek uh, teacher who taught about that. And I think there were also other people teaching about impermanence, but that step further Think about emptiness or not self, that's a new way of expressing which is unique to, to the Buddha. And uh, and, the, and the Buddha has already had, has made it very clear that a deep understanding and experience or realization of that, you know, of emptiness or not self is essential for liberation and of, is essential for the mind being liberated from those emotional and cognitive filters or layers which keep the mind, you know, imprisoned in certain kind of expectation and certain ways of seeing, you know, which are not in sync with reality and because of that you know suffering is the result of that and uh, you know as our practice matures those seven factors of awakening which i've been mentioning before you know they come more and more into balance and then if causes and conditions come together then you know there might be a glimpse of nibbana and this glimpse of nibbana is you know, can liberate the mind from a certain level of those uh, cognitive and emotional filters. And before in the guided meditation, I was uh, pointing out, you know, there can also be a temporary liberation of the mind. If we have a quote unquote, you know, good meditation and the hindrances go into abeyance for some time and the mind is really wide open, and doesn't want to hold on to anything or doesn't want to, you know, uh, reject anything, when the mind can just be open like this. That's a, a temporary taste of the liberated mind. 
And my first teacher, Arjun Puddhadasa, called it a little Nibbana. It's like having a little taste, you know, like when you go to the supermarket and they give you a taste of a certain product so that you might buy the whole thing at one point. So it's that kind of a little taste giving us uh, an experience of that subtle joy if the mind doesn't want anything. And then, you know, we have somehow an idea in which direction we need to go. And it it's becomes clearer and clearer. It has a lot to do with putting things down, with letting things go, not accumulating more. So it's not about accumulating more knowledge or more information, but it's rather, you know, using these instructions in order to have certain direct experiences so that the mind adjusts by letting go of expectation. And that's really what the practice is all about. This, um, you know, getting this glimpse of Nibbana, which is, you know, a moment when the mind is really wide open and not standing on anything. And uh, there's, you know, different ways how that has been expressed, you know, in the teachings and about that, I'd like to speak today a little bit. You know, so the first time, according to the you know, Theravada teaching, you know, when we have this first glimpse of Nibbana is called stream entry, or Sotapanna in the Bali uh, language. And it sometimes is compared, you know, like, seeing to the bottom of the ocean and i think that in the sri lankan tradition it's explained like that that there's like a this is just like a simile you know like a like a giant who has a very big uh, sword you know and he parts the ocean for a moment and then the waters go like this and for a moment we can see the bottom of the ocean and then afterwards the waters come rushing in again but we have seen the bottom of the ocean. We know for ourselves how that looks. Even then, there are tons of waters on top of it again. So it's it's compared with that. And uh, the same is you know this first insight, the first time you know seeing seeing the the unconditioned, seeing the Dhamma eye basically opening for the first time. And uh, and then, you know, all of the thoughts and habits and everything comes flooding back in again. But the first three factors which keeps us bound, you know, to the wheel of becoming, they are permanently let go of after this uh, stream entry. And I'm going to go into the factors in a moment. So the first three factors are cut off permanently. And altogether, you know, we speak about 10 factors in four stages of awakening in the Theravada uh, canon. And uh, I don't know if you've heard about that before. And I think it's, it's uh, quite interesting to have a little bit of information about that, you know, not to get stuck on it in terms of, you know, trying to uh, accomplish something, but use it more like as a, as a map. You know, so when we go somewhere, if we have a map, it's, it's uh, helpful, you know. But then if we get stuck on the map and not really go into the territory, it's not helpful. But just take it, you know, take it lightly, basically. But it, it's good to know that. So this, you know, this uh, seeing of the, the, of the Dhamma, you know, seeing the unconditioned, it happens like four times according to the Pali uh, canon. The first one is stream entry. The first three fetters are permanently cut through. Then the next one is um, it's called Sakadagami in the Pali language. That's a once returner. So it said, you know, that stage is the first three fetters are already gone. And then the next two fetters are to a certain extent diminished. That's the once returner. So that mind stream, you know, is considered to come one more time back to this sense realm here, where we live, you know, as, as human beings. 
and then the next one is the non returner or anagami in the Pali language and according to the teaching is no longer have to come back here in the sense one because the first three fetters are already permanently cut off and the next number four and five are also completely let go of so the first five fetters the lower fetters they are called they are permanently let go of and then there's five higher fetters are left and that's then the last and the fourth stage that's called Arahant in, in the Theravada teaching. So this is the, those four stages. And uh, you know, there's like a gradual quenching of greed, aversion and delusion. You know, and greed is, you know, wanting more of something we like. I'm sure you know how that feels. And aversion is not wanting something. And delusion is, you know, wanting or not wanting something which and being confused about what it really is. So those three different ways of, you know, getting um, sucked into expectations, really, which are the result of those filters, you know, which we need to penetrate through the cultivation of those seven factors of awakening, you know, to penetrate through all of those filters many, many times until they start to just fall apart and just kind of drop away. And then there's the next layer and the next layer gets ever more subtle, ever more subtle. So the first layers are more coarse, they are the five lower fetters, and then it gets more and more subtle and until there are none left. And uh, I think I should just go a little bit into those fetters. I have them written down because of it. You get it otherwise. So they're called Samyochana. And this is like 10 different uh, ways of clinging, how the mind clings, you know, to experience. The first one is, so the first three are, you know, permanently let go of with the stream entry. So the first one is called, uh, in the Pali language, is called Sakaya Diti, or personality belief, you know, believing that I am a separate entity. And then, you know, when I look into it, I see, you know, I eat, I breathe, I drink, I go to the bathroom. I'm not a separate entity. I'm in constant exchange, for example, with the whole planet, with the whole universe. So that's the first. The next, the next one is uh, Vichikicha, skeptical doubt. And that's, you know, having doubt in that there's a way out and that we can do this. It's dream entry that doubt is let go of. And the next one is clinging to mere rules and rituals, you know, believing that, you know, if we keep the precept, that alone is enough. Or that if we do certain things, you know, according to the rules, then that is enough. So this is the first three which are seen through and permanently let go of with dream entry. And then the next two are uh, sensuous craving, Kamaraga and Ilvil Vayapada. So wanting and not wanting. And they get first, you know, they get diminished with uh, one's return and with non-return, they're completely let go of. And then the last five are uh, craving to find material existence and craving to immaterial existence this is rupa raga and arupa raga that's like the different states of uh, chanic states you know deep um, immersion in meditation they can be very very blissful and they can become you know very attractive and you can get stuck on them if one doesn't have a good understanding of what they are really meant support in the practice what they are supporting is you know getting the mind really refined and strong and um, pleasurable 
feeling which comes along with it. Uh, not getting stuck on that. And the next one is uh, conceit, mana, in the sense of, you know, I'm better than you, I'm the same as you, or I'm worse than you. So this kind of comparison, and that is connected with the first fetter, with the personality belief, psychiatry. And the descriptions is compared like, you know, the personality belief would be if you have, let's say you have a t-shirt which has a lot of stains, and those, the personality belief would be the stains, and you go and wash them out, and then afterwards the t-shirt is clean, but there's still like a smell, you know, from that substance which made the stain, that would be the conceit. There's still a little smell there, so then, you know, working on that level is much more refined, but there's still a sense of me. And then the next one, number nine, restlessness, Udacha Kukucha. And the last one is ignorance, Avicha. So that's the four higher fetters, which are, you know, completely uh, let go of with the with Arahantship. Well, you know, what is called also an awakened one or enlightened one, and someone who has completely done the work in, in, the, ter in the terms of the Arahant path. And uh, you know, in the Theravada, there's two, three different paths really one can take, either the Arahant path or the Buddha path or Pacheka Buddha path. So three different paths. And uh, those 10 fetters are you know, the minimum which needs to be done in order to let go of all clinging and craving and through that letting go of all dukkha as well. Because the you nibbana know, is the end of the arising of dukkha or the end of the dependent arising of dukkha, which arises because there is some form of clinging in the mind which, you know, leads to friction and stress because of the fact, you know, that all phenomena are impermanent. Because of that, they are unstable and not to be relied on because they are empty, empty of a self. So if this is really understood, to that degree that the mind really responds with letting go, then there is no more dukkha. There is still unpleasant feeling, unpleasant feeling, but there's no dukkha. Because there's no more clinging in the mind. Because the mind has understood the way things truly are. And, uh, you know, this insight happens when the mind really sees the emptiness of all phenomena. And this, this seeing is like a moment, you know, when the mind is no longer centered around the I, which means, you know, me and mine, when everything is not related to as how can it, you know, serve me or how can it be, uh, you know, a danger to me. But things are just seen for what they are, not related to me. This is this insight, you know, when the mind really shifts, when those fetters are let go of. Because the mind responds to truth with letting go. And that's not something, you know, we, we can learn from books. We can get, you know, certain instructions from books and from people. But then, you know, we have to have that experience for ourselves. And... Uh, you know, for a moment there's nobody is there and we see to the bottom of the ocean and then, you know, the water rushes back in, but we can never forget that again because we have seen it. And what happens then is not the same. The mind has adapted to what it has seen. And that's a mind moment, you know, which is called in the Pali language, Anuloma Chitta, which means adaptation moment. You know, this and this flashing up of this uh, 
of seeing Nibbana, seeing the way things truly are for a moment and then through the seeing some of those fetters are permanently let go of and then the mind continues in a, in a way which is much more capable to open and to deepen and to stay intimate with experience as it is, you know, until then, after some time through the work, then another moment like that arises. And there is, you know, in the different traditions are different uh, ways how that is described, and I could speak about that another time. And, uh, but they're all skillful means, you know, the, the function is, is to guide the mind towards that opening and then you know seeing it as a skillful means and they are all just different modes of expressing but they all are not the real experience because that experience cannot be described with words it's beyond the dualistic mind but we can use words, you know, to guide ourselves towards uh, that experience. And this has been differently done in different traditions, but it's leading to the same experience. And, uh, you know, in the, in the scriptures, there is even children who had this experience. So even, you know, little monks like novice monks, who had, for example, the Buddha's son, Rahula, he said, you know, that he was, a, was an arahant. So it's not a, a huge intellectual undertaking, you know, it has a lot to do with uh, the, those seven factors of awakening being really honed to perfection, so that the mind is sensitized enough that it can approach experience in that way. And... Uh, then, you know, this course change happens in the mind, this anuloma chitta, this adaptation chitta happens because the mind is so refined and resilient and open that it can see through and connect, you know, with that which eradicates those fetters. And... Uh, and most important, you know, for that to happen, there's two things which need to happen. Number one is to, to practice, you know, practice meditation, train the mind. And number two is then to live accordingly. They, they two, they really go together, you know, that, that what we learn on the cushion to really also live it. Because only through that can we integrate it into our own being. And then the mind will respond, it will catch up, you know. But if we meditate, but then we don't believe that, that's not enough, you know, it has to be, everything needs to work together. That's why it's important, you know, to take the precepts, to kind of, you know, to just live it. Because it's like, you know, you go and learn to cook a very healthy meal, and then if you don't eat it, it's not going to be very helpful, you know. So it has to be the whole life that needs to go all in one direction and then uh, it, it automatically you know this process is gonna take 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 off let's say you know because the dhamma itself has this inbuilt quality of leading onwards you know leading us to ever more conducive circumstances if we really live it you know and there is, there is one quality of the Dhamma, which I particularly find very uplifting. It's called Opanaiko, which means you're leading onwards. So that the Dhamma, you know, if you are kind of uh, living it, it responds to you. And so it's, 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 a, it's an integrated package, really. It's not, in the beginning, you know, we start very kind of, like we're learning some things and we read something and then we go on a retreat and then, you know, maybe sometimes we meditate and so on. And then over time, it starts to kind of become more and more integrated. You know, when you're cooking, let's say you're cooking a, a vegetable stew. So in the beginning, it's 
all kinds of like hard little squares, you know, and then the end, it's going to become like a soft kind of a stew, which then is uh, very nourishing, you know, and everything starts to blend with each other. And there's not so much kind of dispersion and fragmentation anymore. And it, it starts to kind of become very um, yeah, nourishing, really, and strengthening. And, you know, as you have at the, at the entrance, the resilience, you know, that everything can teach us then, you know, because it's very clear that all phenomena have this uh, emptiness, the not self as their essence, you know, which can teach us about the way things truly are. And no phenomenon whatsoever is exempt from that truth. So I think you know, that's enough for the day. And, you know, we've started with the refugees and precepts and that teaching leads me back, circles me back exactly to that, you know, that this is the foundation to really stand on for anything because um, it's just the most effective way to live because we are not wasting so much energy and time if we live that. Yeah. And then we have like a few more minutes, you know, if anyone would like to ask a question or make a comment, we have a few minutes. Yeah, it's done. Yeah, can you ask her? You know, it's more like recognizing them being already present in your own mind, you know, because we were to recognize that the seven seconds of awakening is like not some kind of a, you know, far away teaching, but they are operating already in our own mind. And, and then if one can, you know, whatever meditation you're doing, if it's a visualization, a mantra, a, just a meditation on the breath, meditation on the body, whatever you do, you can always notice those seven factors, you know, that really can help to empower the meditation. And then before you end the meditation, whatever it is, also reflect on whatever if it was now visualization or whatever else is permanent, you know. So take a few minutes at the end, reflecting on that too. So it's just a way because whatever meditation object you have, so if those seven factors are not operating, you know, then it's not really gonna be insightful. You know what I mean? Yeah. Contentment. Yeah. Yeah, it does. you know, some people have very intense pity that can be quite, quite unpleasant, you know, because it's so, ooh, you know, so it doesn't, I also don't have that very strong, but I can definitely connect with that subtle joy of not wanting anything else, of really being here, that's where, that is joyful in a subtle way, you know, and, 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 you know, and that often we can also call that contentment, you know, that's something I definitely can experience, you know. And then you can also help it a little bit by reflecting on the fact, you know, you found the teaching, you're keeping the precepts to a certain extent, you know, those things, which are also just very good things, you know. Mm -hmm. I think there was somebody online. Was there? Oh, yes. Um, I, uh, I wanted to... Um... I wanted to ask about bringing our practice to times of personal suffering, that um, um, uh, employing our practice when uh, conditions are not obviously uh, supportive and when there are active distractions um, to practice um, and the importance um, of, uh, of practicing during, uh, during times like that. Yeah. So, and, and what's the question? Well, how how um, 
how is it uh uh, what is what is a skillful way to bring to remember our practice during times of of intense distraction or or personal suffering? Um, yeah, I think you know as soon as you uh, if there's some mindfulness and as soon as you can step out for a moment, you know, out of the stepping out of the identification let's say, you know, whatever, like, let's say, you know, at the end of this, we're going to go outside and we see our car has been totaled, you know, and, and the person drove away, let's say. And then, you know, for a moment we go, oh my God, how can I have all of those things? And then maybe after two minutes, take a deep breath and say, oh, you know, you know, I feel really angry, you know, just starting instead of being completely lost in the thoughts and in the bodily uh, ongoings, you know, to, it's almost like you stand beside yourself, you know, but not in the, in the way that I'm besides myself, but it's more like, you know, to see what's going on in yourself without suppressing it or, or wanting it to be different but to also to be conscious, okay, now I'm really angry and I feel this and I feel that, you know, and just being with that and then just taking a deep breath and maybe, you know, coming inside here, sit down and think, you know, what's a skillful way now to, to start, you know, to work with this. Instead of, you know, doing things in order to get rid of that feeling of, anger maybe or of uh, confusion not feeling a victim you know knowing don't know what to do all of those things all happening at the same time you know not trying to uh, get rid of it by quickly reacting you know but rather allowing it to be there giving it space you know not kind of being so tight you know that that is gonna kind of completely overwhelm you but just giving it the space and then trusting you know that out of that the response will emerge the skillful response will emerge you know because quite often you know we want to quickly get rid of the energetic upset you know inside and just having that kind of uh, you know, resilience, we can call it, or confidence, trust, faith, you know, that we will know what to do. We can allow that to be there, you know, we don't need to get rid of it. The dissonance, you know, of the energetic experience is often something we don't want, you know, because it's painful. And just not interfering with it, you know, trusting it's okay, let it be there. It has a beginning, a middle, and an end, you know, and we don't need to have a knee jerk reaction, you know. And there are so many things, you know, which we are actually making it worse by having these knee jerk reactions, you know. I saw that thing, for example, you know, because my friend who is going to pick me up now, and, and you too, you know, both about the bride. Uh, parade and everything and, and it's going to be terrible with the bath and with the cars and everything and it's every year the same thing you know and in the beginning I was always believing it you know and this year I was just even I wasn't in here for many years now but I just thought it's going to be the same thing again it was exactly the same thing you know so we could have made like a, a real big thing out of it you know and we didn't do anything and it all worked out you know and that's, I mean, that's, of course, only a very small example, you know, but it's so often in our lives, you know, that we have all of these strategies and most things that they, they don't happen, you know, and some things they do happen, but then, you know, to have the faith that a response will emerge, you know, if we are not prematurely messing it all up, you know. And, and I think what we are doing here, you know, on this planet with the whole climate crisis is just the biggest example of, you know, people who don't know what they are doing, interfering with something which is so vastly beyond 
the capacities of our mind to understand, but we're going to tinkering around with it like idiots, you know, and shooting ourselves in the foot constantly, you know. So, you know, this not interfering, and because this, that the wish to interfere comes very often from aversion, you know, or from, you know, grasping, wanting more or not wanting, but interfering in something of which we are just a part, we are not on top of it, we are not in control of it, you know, and that is the not self, you know, that's the, the, the emptiness and to really kind of take our place within that whole process, you know, which is we are definitely not on top of it. It's a kind of complete uh, wrong assumption, you know, we are growing out of it now, I feel, but we have already wrecked so much havoc. For me, that is such a big um, teaching, you know. To always, you know, relate everything back to oneself, what oneself considers pleasant and unpleasant. Who is, who is interested in that? I mean, really. It's just not the most important thing, isn't it? Yeah, I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah. The lay of the land, yeah. Uh-huh. When it depends, you know, if we wouldn't have had a uh, something we promised, you know, that we want to be here at the quarter past one, I think it'd be rather irresponsible, you know, if one has so little time, but if we wouldn't have had an appointment and, but it depends, you know, I think if, if other people rely on us, you know, of course we need to make some preparations, but if it would have been like much more space, you know, we wouldn't have, but we had, we had relatively little space, you know, so I think it, it always depends, isn't it? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's more like, you know, you do what you can within the framework of the kind of what's, what seems sane, you know, and then we need to let go. But I feel also, you know, it's good to prepare, but then you need to let go. Yeah. And, and then mostly things work out somehow, you know. Yeah, and, and, and uh, yeah. You know, to, it, it's like holding it like, you know, not holding it like this, but holding it like this, you know, there is some preparation needs to be made, you know, because you need to book tickets and all of that case. But once you have done what you can, you have to let go. And then you trust, you know. And I think there's this uh, uh, proverb, you know, it says, you know, tie your camel and trust in God, you know. You tie the camel, you know, on the palm tree or whatever, but then you need to trust, you know. But if you don't tie it and only trust in God, I mean, that's not good enough, you know, because then it's just going to wander off, you know, probably. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think... We at the end today and next month, Ayananda Bodhi is going to come here. Yeah? And I'd just like to end with a little chanting and also acknowledge you know, the offering of the meal, Dana. Thank you so much, Paro, and all of you. And also thank you, Albert.
in whose womb would you like to share with your mom and would you like with whom would you like to share the work you have been putting into this lucy and you can they have done and you and you yeah what's your mother's name sandy okay and with all of you as well and with the san francisco dama collective you know that that may be a very stable and uh, long-lasting solution for you May you have every good blessing. May all the devas protect you by the power of all the Buddhas. May you ever be well. May you have every good blessing. May all the devas protect you by the power of all the Dhamma. May you ever be well. May you have every good blessing. May all the devas protect you. By the power of all the Sangha, may you ever be well. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, thank you. I'm combining it with some other things. Yeah, but I, it would be also nice to come, you know, to come into San Francisco. I haven't been here for three years or something. Yes. Thank you.